Welcome back to my series exploring the various ways that sounds change over time in languages. I'd like to wrap up these videos with a look at rules and laws. When someone identifies a regular sound change pattern in a language, or from parent to daughter languages across history, that pattern is traditionally called a sound law. Key laws are named after their discoverers or popularizers, like Grimm's Law. Laws may involve lenition, dissimilation, or any of the sound change types mentioned in previous videos. So, Grimm's Law defines a systematic sound change in Proto-Germanic, the parent of every Germanic language, from Icelandic to German to Gothic to English. Part of Grimm's Law involves devoicing of voice and stops, so the Proto-Indo-European root Gwyn turned into Quen, woman. The English cognate is queen. We can write that particular rule as voiced stops become voiceless stops. Grimm's Law and other sound laws are built out of rules. These rules are the conventional way that historical linguists state how sounds change in a language. The basic formula is simple. Give the sounds that change, the sounds that they change into, and the environments where that change takes place. So in Portuguese, the letter S is pronounced Z between two vowels, like in the word casu. Here's the rule notation that tells us intervocalic S is pronounced Z in that environment. And here is the rule that voiced stops in Proto-Indo-European turned into voiceless stops in Germanic regardless of environment. The order and relationship of rules is crucial for understanding their significance in the development of a language. For instance, you can use your understanding of rules to establish a relative chronology, meaning that you can determine which changes took place earlier than others in a language's history. Let's imagine a simple human language. We'll give it a cool name like X. X underwent two minor sound shifts. In one shift, N became M before a labial consonant. This language has the labials P and F. In other words, N assimilates to a following labial. In the second shift, a short unstressed I was deleted, but only if it occurred between two consonants. In other words, unstressed I undergoes syncope. Now X has a word emphi. Comparing data from closely related languages, just as we did in the introduction to historical linguistics, we've been able to reconstruct the proto-form of that word as yenifi. Now that I've given you this info, tell me, which sound change happened first? Deleting i or changing n to m? To help you answer that question, let's build rules for the two sound changes. First, n becomes m before a consonant with the feature labial. Second, unstressed i becomes nothing when it's between two consonants. If the proto word is yenifi, then applying rule one first leaves us with, well, yenifi. Since n doesn't assimilate to a following consonant, it comes before a vowel. But then rule two applies, leaving us with yenfi. But language x has yemfi, not yenfi. So scratch that. Try the reverse order. Rule two turns yenifi into yenfi. And now rule one can apply, leaving us with yemfi, which is exactly what we find. So it looks like rule two took place before rule one, which is our relative chronology. This fictitious but credible example from language X raises awareness about not only the timeline of rules, but the order of those rules. When an earlier rule creates an environment in which a later rule can operate, the two rules are said to have a relationship described as a feeding order. The earlier rule feeds into the second one. So in language X, rule number one, which deleted I, allowed rule number two, which changed N to M, to apply. That's an example of a feeding direction. When the rules are reversed, the earlier rule abandons an environment which is filled by the later rule, the result is a counterfeiting order. 
Let's imagine that early in its history, our language X had a rule that deleted M before a consonant, any consonant whatsoever. The parent language had a word lamfi, but this first rule, M becomes nothing between a vowel and a consonant, applied to that proto word, giving the output lafi in language X. A later rule, the one we're already familiar with, changed N to M before a labial consonant. So rule 1 deleted M's before consonant, but rule 2 put them right back in. Not in the same words, but it recreated the environment. When an earlier rule creates an environment in which a later rule cannot operate, the two rules are in a bleeding order. The outcome? The first rule applies, and the second one doesn't. Go back to language X, which has a rule that deletes M after a vowel, but before a consonant. It was this rule that changed the proto-word lamfi to lafi. Young speakers of X are applying a new rule these days. They insert a P in the consonant cluster, M, F. So instead of saying mf, they say mf. But they fail to apply rule number two to lafi, which lost its cluster MF thanks to rule number one. When the bleeding rules are reversed, the earlier rule operates, followed by the later rule, which would have prevented the earlier rule from applying. The result is a counter-bleeding order. The outcome here is different. Both rules apply. Return to our rule in language X that deletes an unstressed I in the middle of a word. But here's a new rule that moves stress to the penultimate, the second to last syllable of a word. That first rule helped turn yenifi into yemfi. But it also caused the word afisa to change to afsa. This new accent shift moves the stress to the first syllable, resulting in the modern word afsa instead of afsa. Had afisa changed to afisa, it would have prevented the rule that deletes that unstressed i. But since it happens second, the two rules apply in a counter-bleeding direction. This series has taken the time to share types of sound changes with you, as well as how to state those sound changes using phonological rules. I appreciate your interest and your attention throughout this series, and I thank you for taking the time to learn with me.